I think since we uh, we have one short hour, we will go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is Christina Hendricks. I'm the academic director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. And I wanna welcome you to this uh, session on uh, nominating or being a, a nominee for a 3M National uh, uh, Teaching Fellow Award. I wanna go over a couple of logistics and then I will introduce um, Simon Bates to, to give a, a bit of an introduction as well. So a couple of logistics. First of all, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, let's see. Go. Okay, so this is where you're at. Hope you're in the right place, celebrating teaching excellence, nominating a 3M National Teaching Fellow. A little bit of uh, uh, what we're doing with Zoom today. So we are recording the session. So audio and video will be recorded and shared publicly with some minor edits, like we're going to cut out that beginning where we're all just sort of waiting for people to, to come. Um, discussions in the chat room, if you give them to everyone, will not be shared publicly. They'll be recorded just for the sake of us creating some notes from the session. But in the chat, you can do either to everyone or you can do to an individual. If you just send it to an individual, like um, to one of the uh, uh, moderators who I'll introduce in a moment, um, that recorded. So if you want something to, if you want to ask something but don't want to be named publicly, you could do it that way. You could do it in the chat because that will not come out in the recording. And just to give you a couple more logistics, uh, if you're not speaking, please uh, mute yourself because it can get pretty loud with background noise. And we do have a host, Carissa Block, who will be um, potentially, if there's a lot of noise, might end up muting you uh, if, if you have forgotten to do that. Um, the chat moderators are Judy Chan. Judy can give a wave. Uh, Judy Chan will be there uh, answering questions or taking in questions for anything related to 3M. And we also have Carissa Block who will be taking questions or concerns that are related to technology. So you can just do a chat to everyone if you want to, or you can do a chat individually to Judy Chan or Carissa Block. Carissa, I think has already, but um, may uh, uh, again share the um, attendance form. I can't with Zoom apparently see the chat at the same time as I'm sharing my screen. So I can't see if it's in there already. So please fill out the attendance form. And at the end, we'll be asking you to fill out a feedback form. So Judy will share that link uh, at the end of the session. So I'd like to introduce Simon Bates to give a, a brief introduction. He is the Associate Provost Teaching and Learning at uh, University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really nice to see all of you. I, I logged on and thought, these are some of my very favorite people here. So uh, some, not all of my favorite people, but many, many of them. Um, it's really nice to, to have this opportunity to connect in these most uh, unprecedented of, uh, of times. Just looking at um, the, the video wall, I just want to point out, it may look like myself and Catherine Rohn are in the same room because of the decor behind us, right? I can assure you we are appropriately socially distanced by about 50 kilometers, I would guess, but uh, um, there we go. Everyone's, everyone's showing their, apart from Judy, everyone's showing their, uh, their true background rather than a fake background. So if this was an exam, we'd have to do a room scan to make sure that uh, Catherine and I really weren't in the same room for collaborating. Um, anyway, it's, it's my pleasure to sort of kick off this discussion. It's also a great pleasure to be having a conversation that's not about uh, immediate planning scenarios for COVID-19. So it's nice to see that some semblance of business as usual with the, the 3M National Teaching Fellow process uh, is able to, uh, to continue. Um, I don't have um, too much to say, uh, except to um, welcome all the 3M um, fellows 
that we've got from UBC uh, on the call today. Uh, it is a self-nomination process, so essentially anyone can decide to put themselves forward. Uh, what Christina and I have been working on in the, the past couple of years is putting a little bit more support and, and, and scaffolding at the beginning of that process that people might embark on. And this webinar uh, is one of the ways that we've been trying to uh, put a little bit more information uh, up front, if you like, as to uh, helping people understand um, the process and ideas for uh, what makes a successful application. But the best people really to, uh, to speak to that are the, uh, the fellows themselves. Um, just in terms of the process, as you know, there's a, um, an institutional uh, letter that gets written from the provost's office. Uh, and so that's where I've had the opportunity to interact with, uh, with many of the fellows who, uh, who are on the call today. Um, so that's really all I had to say. Welcome, happy to be part of this, uh, this conversation. And I will turn it back to, uh, to Christina to introduce the, uh, the panelists. Great, thank you, Simon. So uh, we do have a set of questions that we've, we've preset for the panelists, uh, but at the same time, you should be able to uh, interject with your questions in the chat um, and we can get to them. I'm, I'm trying very hard to reserve enough time at the end to get to your questions as well. So if it looks like we're getting a little bit uh, too far into our preset questions and we're running out of time, then we'll, we'll just move to your questions. So I want to start off by introducing our national uh, 3M National Teaching Fellows. So we've got uh, a couple, uh, a number of people on the call today, and there's also a couple of people who are 3M Fellows uh, at UBC who could not make it today. But on the call, we have Tiffany Potter, who's from the English Language and Literatures Department, who won in 2020. She's a professor of teaching and also the Associate Head of Curriculum and Planning. We have Paul Cubbin from the Scudder School of Business, who also won in 2020. So these two recently uh, got their awards, which is wonderful. Paul is a lecturer and in Marketing and Behavioral Science Division and also the Assistant Dean of Innovation. Stephen Barnes won last year from Psychology. He is a Associate Professor of Teaching. Uh, well, I think maybe those titles of our, our official uh, July 1st, but uh, I'm still using them now. Maya Kurzik from Land and Food Systems in 2016. Uh, Maya is an Associate Professor of Applied Biology and Forest and Conservation Sciences. Peter Ostafichuk from Mechanical Engineering from 2015, uh, Professor of Teaching. Darren Dahl, Sauter School of Business from 2013, Professor and a Senior Associate Dean, Faculty, and director of the Robert H. Lee Graduate School. And Simon Ellis from Forestry, also won in 2013, who's an associate professor and program director of the BSC Wood Products Processing Program. Now, other 3M teaching fellows who are at UBC who could not make it today are Sarah Harris from Earth and Ocean Sciences and also the uh, associate dean academic and faculty of science. And Anthony Clark from Curriculum and Pedagogy in um, the uh, uh, School of Education. So those are our fellows, those <coughs> our panelists today. We have eight questions. Don't know if we're going to get through them all, um, but they range from when, what you consider being nominated for the fellowship, how might you prepare, when did you start preparing, what aspects of the process did you find challenging, so these are our questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon, for, for pointing that out. Um, so I don't know that we'll get to all eight, um, but we will start going through them one by one. And I've asked uh, our panelists to focus on one question, possibly two, depending on the time that we have. Okay, so our first question. When in one's career might one consider being nominated for this fellowship? So I'm asking Maya, Maya Kersay, to get us started on this question, on her answer. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, um, I'll try to be short. Um, the short answer to this question is you should start pre um, preparing when you feel ready that you have enough material um, to present a compelling 
and winning uh, case. Um, specifically, when is that going to be for each of us is different. Um, some people might achieve that uh, point earlier than others. Um, I would say based on just informal look around who were the fellows um, at the time when I won and who attended the conference in 2016, um, I would say that most people were kind of mid-career, but they were also people who were either younger or older than that. Um, so it, it really depends and it, it is really based on having a compelling case, not that there is a specific right time um, to, to apply. Great. Uh, Peter, do you have any other thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with what Maya said. I, I think uh, um, we often hear it described as it's not a lifetime achievement award. So it's not a, a late career. It's difficult very early career because uh, you don't have that, that history behind you. I, I made a little graphic. I don't know if people can see my screen. I was uh, looking off in the other direction a little bit, uh, creating this, uh, this visual aid. But um, if that's kind of career trajectory if you're able to see uh, my video there um, and you're thinking about time in career you know we don't start at zero but uh, we kind of plateau throughout the stage of our career I kind of almost think of it as um, uh, the the 3m is kind of a bit of a boost here in in your career like kind of the mid career point it gives Gives you a little bit of a kick that uh, that elevates things a little further. So, um, yeah, I'd echo what Maya said. Uh, it, it depends on the person. It's not late career. It's not very early career. It's it's generally somewhere in the middle. Great. Anybody else from the panel want to, to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that there's. Um, I mean, you know, I have a degree with both uh, other panelists. Um, there's also times during your career where it's actually more convenient to do it. Um, th that is, it's, it, there's less work involved. So this is right after, for example, you've created a, a tenure package, right after you've created a promotion package. Um, a lot of that work, um, it's going to be, you still need to do a lot of work on it, but a lot of that work can be, can be used when you do your 3M application as well. And it also helps your nominator because they have that entire tenure package and promotion package in front of them to write all of their stuff, which is a lot. So it helps them as well. Great, thanks. So let's move on to question number two. How might one prepare for being potentially nominated in a few years? What should one work on in order to receive a successful fellowship later? So I've got Simon Ellis as first on this one. First of all, Christian, I just want to say you mentioned uh, two other uh, fellows who weren't on the call. There's, I think there's a total of about 20 of us in total at UBC. So there's, really? there's, there's many not on the call as on the call. They go back to, wow, a while ago, the first person who won it. But, uh, so, so it's interesting when Christina sent around who had been uh, sort of assigned each of these questions, I thought, damn, I got that one. Because I, I don't actually think it's that good a question. Because I, I would hope that those people who are thinking about putting a package in in the next couple of years aren't guy, you know, that isn't the sole guiding light to what they do over the next two years in terms of, you know, should I do this because it will help my package, yes or no. I think ultimately, um, you know, you get to a point where you have a body of work that has accumulated and you're, you're doing this stuff because it's what you believe in and it's what your professional life is about. So, so yes, I mean, absolutely seek out uh, educational leadership opportunities because that's really the important part of a package. So yes, you have to be a good teacher, primarily in the undergraduate uh, field, um, as far as this, um, applications are concerned, but it really is the education leadership part that I think starts to put people uh, apart from um, other applications. So, so yeah, to take on, seek out and take on leadership, uh, education leadership opportunities, but, but because it's what you're doing in your professional life and it's what you, you, you believe in rather than, is this going to make my application um, better? I, I hope that's what people, uh, why people are doing this. Because I think what's important in an application, and this is stealing one of your Darren, Darren parts of part of your question, sorry. Uh, but you know what what is important is, is, is a narrative and a, and a and a theme throughout applications. I think so. It's not just a bunch of stuff in long lists to say, look at what I've done. It's Simon's laughing at me. It's um, it, 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 it's it is it's a story. It's a con internally consistent story. 
uh, that allows you to be distinguished from some of the other applicants. There's, there's 40 to 50 applicants each year, I think, and there's 10 of these awarded. And so it's, it's making yourself uh, to be, you know, your personality to come out, if you like, your educational personality to come out. So please don't do, don't spend the next two years you know, living your life just to get your application in a better package. Hopefully, you say just what you do in your professional career will 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 lead into that body of work. Great, thank Bye. you. Nope, that's great. Tiffany, do you have anything to add on this one? What I realized um, when I was putting mine together um, was um, that I think the communities became what, it, what became increasingly obvious to me as I was both, I did my professor of teaching um, file about six months before we started the, the 3M file. Um, and what I realized is that the communities were absolutely essential to the difference between um, full disclosure, I was actually nominated three times. This is not a speedy process. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm one would like to be so amazing and wonderful and, and maybe Paul and Simon and others are. Um, but, you know, I, I went through, you know, my, uh, my department has a very energetic nominator. She was amazing and insistent. Um, but I think that what I realized the difference between my first file and my third file was the communities I was part of. And that what my third file really a ton of really big things that I was part of that I was supporting and continuing um, almost none of us do these big projects by ourselves um, and so I think thinking I mean again I, I totally agree with Simon that we're not doing this to get an award um, but it, the difference between my first very much unsuccessful file <laughs> and my and my third successful one was the communities I was part of so it seems to me that that if you're thinking both to professor of teaching um, and to 3M, it seems to me those are, are really important elements. Great, thank you. Move on to question three. When did you as a nominee start preparing and when would you suggest nominees start preparing? So uh, it's Paul as the uh, first, first person on this one. Thank you. Uh, first I want to say hi to Tiffany because of COVID-19 we haven't actually met yet we tried to uh, and so it's lovely to see you even if it is uh, on screen and uh, my congratulations to you and um, I can tell you that I was nominated four times um, so for those who are saying when did, when did you start preparing about six years ago um, and uh, for those who are laughing, uh, uh, and I'm, lo I'm, lo I'm actually looking to Stephen because I remember sitting in this meeting last, last year and he said, yeah, I wasn't really going to apply. And then somebody kind of told me to, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Stephen, but it was, and uh, yeah, it's the first time I did it. I, I didn't realize it couldn't happen the first time, you know, and you put, you, put, you put a good and successful package together quickly. And the reason I kind of try and contrast that is, is, is I think for many people, it will be not the first time around. Um, and therefore, um, you've got to be kind of knowing that this is a long game. And I think it plays a little bit to Simon's point. You're not doing, you're, you're not, you're not doing things to try and be a 3M uh, uh, fellow. You're doing the things you do, and then you're trying to find out how to tell your story in a way which is compelling. Um, and so, uh, you, I mean, you're, you're trying to uncover the, and make transparent what others around you, you see. Um, I think that in terms of um, um, other suggestions is, is read the website guidance well. I found it surprisingly good and useful. And I mean, it tells you what they're looking for. Um, and so I think a lot of people as well, they try to maybe pass what they've done for some other purpose. Uh, and this needs to be started from scratch in, in my view. Great, thank you. And Stephen, as, as a, a recent winner as well, do you have things to add? To this? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll focus on sort of the, the shorter timeline. Paul's, Paul's advice is all really good. Um, so I would highly suggest um, that someone not start any later than July of the year that it's due um, if you're preparing an application. Even my earlier comment related to, you know, there being a certain amount of convenience associated with having prepared a tenure package or a promotion package. Um, as Paul pointed out, that's 
really uh, it really it really needs a lot of modification from that it's a completely different story um and it is a story as was pointed out earlier um so thinking and and reflecting on what that story uh is going to be um should begin even well before july i mean you should probably be thinking about it uh, now uh, if you're planning to attend uh, apply for the fall um, the other thing that um, you have to bear in mind is the amount of work that your nominator has to do. So the earlier that you get your part done and you give them the, the letter writer's name, probably the better, um, because they're going to be able to provide you some guidance too as to your part of the package based on the letter writer's comments and the um, comments from students that they've seen. Good, and let me just add that um, the last I checked, which was yesterday, the STLHG website did not have a due date for the, this year's um, uh, application process yet, uh, but in previous years, it has been in September, as far as I recall. So I think uh, that is likely to be the case as well this year. So the timeline would still be uh, uh, correct. Does anybody else from the panelists have anything to add on this one? It, it might just be worth adding that you know we're, we're so used to maybe being last minute and if you see september the 15th probably going to simon and asking for the letter of support from the provost uh, on september the 14th wouldn't be that helpful so there is an inter there is an internal kind of guidance deadline if you actually want that help i'd say yeah. also it's important to think about the people you're going to ask to write letters you need letters from student former students for example and um i've had late essays before <laughs> it, it's some you know you 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 need to make sure you have a lot of time and a lot of cushion um and, and a lot of protection not just the students um but you're getting you you are asking a lot of other people to do things for you which was one of the things i found most difficult um and so early lets them feel like they actually have the time to do what you're asking them to do or if they say i really can't to, for you to find an alternative so i think that being respectful of the amount of work you're asking other people to do means starting early may i add one thing since Stephanie Absolutely. mentioned letters um it's not and i completely agree it takes a long time to get the letters but i found for this um, application to be even more important that, than for other um, awards or applications to, to just get letters with just very brief um, I, idea that you usually give to the non, to people who are writing them. In this case, I, I thought that it was very important that letters also fit the whole narrative of the application. So it's not just your statement about your leadership uh, um philosophy and teaching philosophy and um other bits and pieces that, that you are high it is really important that letters fit um in the package so that not everybody is saying the same thing um and that takes even longer time because you might have once you see all the letters or no, if you don't see them but whoever is the preparing the package for you who is helping you if they see that the same thing was said over and over that happened to me um they had to go back to the people writing letters to rewrite them basically which lengthens the process that's an excellent point thank you and we'll get to this i'll reiterate this again at the end but in terms of getting a letter from the provost office uh, it needs to be your dossier needs to be ready about a month in advance of the deadlines and sent to the sent to simon basically for that letter okay next question what aspects of the nomination process did you find challenging and how would you suggest others address those challenges and i have tiffany up for this one first Oh, I found so many things challenging. <laughs> um, and, and part of it is my personality and part of it is the task. Um, so if you start with the task, as I said, I had just done my professor of teaching file, which is in many ways this giant accumulation of lists with an essay contest in the middle. Um, and I, you know, so I had just done that, but which meant I had this giant pile of stuff and figuring out with that 50 page limit, what 
was valuable, what was, as, as everybody has said, and Simon was just absolutely my mentor through this process. Simon Ellis was my mentor through this process. Um, but the figuring out what your story is, and I know we all keep saying that, um, and it was really hard. And, and I'm, I'm in English, it's, that's supposed to be my thing. Um, and it was really hard to decide what my story was of the, you know, I mean, I've been here for 20 years of the umpteen projects I've been involved in. What were the ones that really defined what I see as, as my contribution to teaching and learning at UBC and, and beyond, one hopes. Um, so that was the first thing was deciding what my story was. And that was actually really hard because it means just jettisoning a ton of things that were really important <laughs> at the time that I was doing them. Um, and the second thing that Simon told me um, that was incredibly important was don't overstuff. <laughs> um, I had, you have all these things. Um, and my first version, I'm embarrassed to admit, was just this dense block of text. Um, and it was every word I could possibly squeeze in there into those 50 pages. And I mean, I, I lessened the amount of space between text lines. Uh, you know, I mean, I was cramming it all in there and it was in retrospect, terrible. Um, and what I re realized and, and the comment on that file, their feed really not that helpful. Um, but the comment on that file was, it was really hard to read. Um, and the comment on my successful file, one of them was, it was so enjoyable to read, to, to read this file, to feel like we know you and what you do. And so that personalizing of it, um, photos, um, you know, a little bit more of a narrative quality, um, and, and definitely my third file had much more of a human quality. Um, and so letting go of my academics need to include everything um, and figuring out, the, one of the hardest parts was figuring out how I was gonna tell that story. The other part that was, and we've all got, every person on this call has a hundred things they could talk about. Um, so deciding what was important um, and how to tell that story and how to air it out, how to give it space was actually really hard for me. And the last, the other thing has perhaps to do with my personality, but I think it's common for a lot of us, was it's hard to talk about me. Um, that was finding the line between saying that you've done valuable things and feeling uncomfortable talking about yourself doing valuable things was a hard line for me. And that also came up in the uh, I mean, I'm an English professor, I can do it. Um, but it was it was a challenge for me sort of personally. And it also came up in when we were, you know, involved in the in the generation of letters, um, and and ask and having to ask people to take not small chunks of time and give it to me for this thing, uh, for, for this recognition that I, you know, am, am incredibly grateful for but I'm still slightly dubious that, that I was the one who should have gone. <laughs> um, and so, so I think those are my, those were the things that I personally struggled with. Um, and again, I had guidance from people who were just incredibly helpful in telling me how, in, in giving me permission to not include everything. Great, thank you. Paul, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, but a lot, a lot to agree with as well. I mean, I, I think listening to Tiffany has reminded me that the, the whole process is actually very humbling. And once you've started, it's hard to stop because you feel like you're letting people down because you've asked people to, um, you've asked people to support you and they have significantly. And then it's kind of like, wow, you know, I got to do this. And then it's kind of like, you know, then it's, wow, people think this about me, uh, but they don't know about all my flaws. Um, so it's a very, I'd say it's a very, um, personal journey in the end uh, uh, and you know each time that I'd put a unsuccessful dossier forward I then said to Darren who was my sponsor and champion on this never again right I'm done right and he said okay sleep on it for a few months uh, and then somehow you know he, he, um, we, we, we had another go and I think what I found was is, is, is that by the last time I actually was was really at peace with the fact that, that I might not ever get this because it had been so valuable to me personally and I never would have seen that at the beginning so I guess 
the hard part of it was what then became the easy part, which was that this was a professional development kind of reflection. Um, and so, you know, for me, so do, doing it some way into your career um, kind of made sense because you suddenly kind of put the pieces together that you might not have even seen yourself. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, is, is I think on the, this may sound a bit crass because half of the dossier is about teaching excellence, but there's nobody applying or being encouraged to apply who isn't excellent on the teaching side. So that's kind of the table stakes. Uh, and the, it's the education piece, which is, I think, hard to put a compelling story together. And what became clear to me in the feedback over several iterations is, is that it wasn't enough just to show educational leadership at your, in your own faculty or even your own institution. And I think this plays to the point Tiffany made earlier about communities. You have to show how you're having impact beyond your university. Um, uh, and you know, that, that, that's challenging. You can't make that up. Uh, you, have, you have to kind of see kind of maybe where you've been connected that you may not have always kind of appreciated. Great, thank you. That may lead into our, our next one, which is, do you have a sense of which aspects of nominations might make them more or less successful? I'm gonna ask Darren to uh, sure. answer this one. So uh, a lot has been said, and I actually had about eight, eight or nine points that I wanted to make, and, and a number of them have been made, so I'll just quickly reinforce those. But I think uh, having seen probably six of these now go through, six iterations, there is an element of review or draw here. Uh, and, you know, that's something that, that we just don't control in academia. And so, you know, who, who reads it, how they read it is, is, is the X factor that you can't control. But there's a number of things that you can do to help the nomination be successful. Um, number one in my book is story, and that's been mentioned repetitively, so I won't reinforce that other than to say that that is the number one thing I think that leads to success is are you telling the story? Number two to me, and it's been said, was personalize. Make it human. Uh, that tends to be something that really wins with respect to these, in my opinion. The third that I think uh, fundamentally most important, and Paul just stated it, is the educational leadership. And as a third point, uh, the table stakes are excellence. Everyone that does this is an excellent teacher. They get great ratings. People look at them as inspirational, yada, yada. But it's really how have you made an impact? And I guess that's what I would would say maybe a bit of an add-on to what's been said before is, is think about crystallizing what does impact mean with respect to your teaching portfolio? Where have you had impact? And it really does have to be broader than just your course and your little sandbox. Uh, what gets rewarded here is impact uh, at a university level, at a national level, at an international level. So that's something that you should be thinking about if you're, if you're hoping to apply is, you know, where does that impact land? Uh, a notion was raised on, on being balanced. Uh, and I think it was Tiffany that said that in terms of how much you talk yourself up versus you don't, but it's a pure balance. And I've seen uh, feedback that says, you know, you've talked too much, it's too braggy. And then on the flip side, you don't talk enough about yourself. And so you're too Canadian. And so you've got to get that sweet spot in the middle where you are you know, getting the right tone as, as you flow through the process. The last one to reinforce that someone also said is this notion of letters. Uh, the support letters are critical and they should align to the story that you're telling. But I would take it even a step further. I think you wanna be a bit strategic uh, with you and your sponsor in terms of letters. Uh, the letters should be sourced according to the, the type of point you need them to make. And so it's just not a cattle call for letters. You should be thinking about colleagues, students, uh, people that you've had an impact on in other ways. And then don't write the letters for them. That's not what I'm saying. But you should be seeding the letters strategically uh, so that you can have them fit into the story that you're actually trying to, trying to deliver. I would say you oversample on letters. Uh, when I worked with Paul, you know, we would ask for 10 letters and we'd use four. And, and so, you know, you're able to actually fit that into the narrative that you're trying to align to. The other ones that are a little new that I would add, um, organization and clarity are huge. It's 50 pages. And if it's just a laundry list of blah, 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 you will never win. And so you have to think about the narrative in terms of clarity and organization. And that's, that's fundamental. Uh, a second one that I wanted to say is, is the notion of alignment. 
everything should align to the narrative that you're talking about. If you, if you have a piece that doesn't align to the narrative, then it should be dropped and eliminated. So organization, clarity, and alignment, I think are something that haven't been said that I would point to. And then the last one, I promise I'm done, is you need to have a bit of a hook. And what I mean by that is what's interesting or unique um, about your story. And that's what they're really, I find, looking for when I look at the winners each year. And, and Paul and I have, have analyzed it over the last number of years. Each winner has something that's a bit unique and a bit interesting about their storyline, whether it's the background that they come from, some big innovation they've done, or the impact in a very specific way. And so try to think about what's the hook with respect to the story that you're actually telling. And so that's hopefully not too comprehensive, but a lot of ideas that I at least have noticed over the years uh, with respect to these nominations. Great, thank you. Maya, do you have anything to add? That was very comprehensive there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but also, also true because, yeah, I forgot about some things, but yes, the hook is definitely important and it helps um, that that hook about what is interesting about you maybe even comes in the um, provost letter because provost letter is at the top of your uh, package and then there are other sections. Uh, but you and your helpers who, who help you put this together are the ones who are who who have to identify um, the, the hook. You cannot wait for the provost or whoever is helping the provost to identify it for you. Um, and it really needs the package. The only thing I will add is the package re really needs to be one unit. needs needs to speak about you. Um, and it has to be way more personal than what we are usually used to about writing about ourselves. Nobody, I think, likes to write about him or herself, but this package is very personal and it goes to people who will not necessarily come, most likely will not come from your discipline. So you have to write it in a way that somebody who is not in your discipline will understand your leadership and your impact and what exactly you've done that's worthy of nomination. So, um, and for me, not coming from literature, um, this was a challenge because this was after probably first, first thing that I wrote after high school that had some literature aspect in, in what I was writing. Uh, um, keep that in mind, uh, even more so than for other other applications that um, it has to be a bit more literally um, um, than what, what we usually, most of us are writing. Great, thank you. So we've got uh, a couple more. What do you suggest nominees and the nominator not do? So we've got successful or unsuccessful. What mistakes might they avoid? So I've got Pete up for this one. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, uh, the, to answer this one, really, it, it's been answered. Everybody going before uh, has said the elements of the su successful um, application. And, um, uh, you know, the notes I had were things like um, large lists of your accomplishments, uh, being overly boastful or not being self-promoting enough, lack story and so on. Uh, and I, so I don't want to just go through and, and list all of those things again. Uh, wh what I might say is um, with my cohort, uh, there were, uh, we were off, off at the Banff um, Resort, uh, I think when it was still back there. And before we went, we agreed to share all our dossiers. So we, we shared our packages with one another. We read each of ours um, before we met in person, basically. And um, the common themes were exactly what's being said. Everybody's was personal. There was a story about them. It had a hook. Each one of the 10, there was a hook that grabbed you. And, you know, thinking of story, um, it, there was a beginning, middle, and end. You know, there was, there was, it was set up in the beginning. There was um, some interest and you wanted to keep reading and find out more about how the story was going to end. And then there was a conclusion at the end of the, the package. So I, I would say, you know, that element of narrative and story and hook are extremely important. Um, I did want to pick up on uh, what was said about uh, repurposing other materials. And I think 
uh, it's great to look back to things that you've already done, other applications, you know, promotion, tenure, those things. Uh, draw inspiration from them, but I would say here you want to start absolutely fresh. Um, so pull ideas from those, but before you start doing that, have uh, uh, build in your mind what your narrative is. Um, the other one, uh, maybe that I'd add that hasn't been said here is um, the importance of sticking to the criteria that they give you. Um, there are, uh, I think, the year when I was uh, when I applied, um, I heard it was about a hundred applications they were going through. And I had uh, I had talked to a couple of people, and they what they essentially heard was the committee they're looking for ways to get that that number down. So everybody is so strong, uh, all the applications are so strong. This isn't a matter of pulling out the ten strongest. Uh, the way they described it was they're they're just looking for any reason to pull some out to make their list their their group that they have to search through smaller. Um, and I, I was asking Gary Poole actually a question about, about this. I had 51 pages and I said, you know, is, is that, he said, they're going to remove that right away. Um, doesn't matter what's inside. That just makes their job that much easier. And uh, so definitely stick to the criteria that are there. Follow those. Um, I think it, to pick up on one thing, I believe Darren said it and, and a couple others, the balance of EL and teaching. Everybody is, you know, the teaching will shine through on its own. So um, the uh, educational leadership piece, that's the, the thing that your, your narrative, your story really has to tie into. Um, make sure they're both in there, but it's the EL that deserves the effort, I think. But uh, other than that, yeah, everything that's been, that others have, have said, I think uh, uh, I, I agree with entirely. Thanks. We're gonna move to the last question and then if there's no questions from the audience, we'll I'll let the panelists reply to anything they wish. So if there's one thing you would have done differently looking back, what would it be, Stephen? So <laughs> I was actually, while everyone was talking there, I was looking at my actual package um, and <clears throat> we keep on talking about 50 pages. I just looked and I actually ended up, my component of the package was seven pages. So that's how much space I actually had to give my story. Um, and that includes both the educational leadership and the um, writing. Why is it so short? It's because all those letters, all those comments from students, from courses you've taught, everything else, um, and the, the components written by your nominator uh, take up those 50 pages. And so the sooner you actually have a, a page count, some sort of sense of how much space you have to work with, uh, the better. So I left that too late and I was constantly fiddling with length, um, which is, it was driving me nuts, uh, quite frankly. Um, uh, so, you know, one day I would be told, okay, you have eight pages. Oh, actually you have nine pages because the letter writer wanted to change this about their letter. Um, so the sooner you can get all those other pieces in, the, the, the less of a, ongoing piece of work it's going to be for you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to reiterate too, um, you know, the, the telling of the story is critical. What I, what I started off when I, when I was doing my package and didn't do correctly, according to my nominator, was um, emphasizing too much, uh, well, making it more, more list-like than, than story-like. And I think the story is really critical. Um, I think it's really important to realize, too, that um, educational leadership is one way of showing your reach beyond the university, but uh, having students who, and you're, you're supposed to get letters from former students, having students who, um, have, who can speak to the impact of your teaching on their lives um, is critical. Like, what, what are they doing now five years after they took your course, and how did, their, how did your course, if anything, uh, affect their lives. Uh, and that's impact beyond the classroom in addition to EL. Um, and I think um, when I spoke to the other members of the 3M cohort that I won with uh, that, that year, um, all of us seem to have this connection with our students um, and this sort of empathic connection with our students that seem to be a common thread. And yeah, I think you just want to make sure you're looking for students who, can, who are letter writers who can speak to um, to that aspect of your teaching, the impact of your teaching beyond the classroom. Sorry, that was a mixture of what I shouldn't have done differently and what I, what I think people should do, sorry. That's totally fine. No, it's really useful, thank you. I've gotten a question on the chat, which is how do you find a nominator? 
So anybody from the panel. I can say that my department uh, actually has a, a, a service job that is um, essentially awards. We have one faculty member whose titled service role is awards coordinator. Um, and it's not student awards, someone else does that. It is nominating faculty members for research awards and, and, and teaching awards and service awards. And so we actually have a, a faculty member who's designated to do that. And much to my dismay, Eva Marie Kroller has retired this year. Um, uh, but you know, it is, it, we actually had someone who's, who, who, for whom it was their actual role. So if your department has that, that it seems to me is the first person to reach out to. They may not be someone who's aware of the 3M, um, but they can certainly help you. I think it's important that the nominator truly know you as an educator. I mean, I, it's not just an administration role that somebody is doing, contacting these people and, you know, who are making the, the, the various letters of reference. It's their they're that fresh set of eyes that can look at your package to say you know you really aren't doing a very good job of, of really explaining what you do here or you haven't uh played up this part of your um you know your educational life when i was lucky my nominator was somebody i ta'd in the 1980s then he served as my ta and then he was my department head so i you know I, I had somebody who i knew for a long time but it has to be somebody who genuinely knows you who can and so i'd say it's not just doing the paperwork on it but that they they can you know really be a good set of eyes to help you this, this bleeds into the, the last question uh, too, but I, I would add to what Simon said, because Simon is 100% correct. You, you need someone that knows Always. you. Always. Oh, careful. <laughs> um, but I would also go with what Tiffany said. I, I would say it takes a bit of a village. And, and though I was the primary nominee or nominated for Paul, uh, we actually involved a number of people, everyone from Simon Bates to TLT to the central head office provost to our faculty had administrative people that helped. So it's not a one person support system, I would say, uh, but you do need someone that A, is organized, that helps to get to the, the finish line and B, someone that really knows you and can give you honest feedback. So that's what I would say you should be looking for. Another I think oh, too, if you're reaching out to someone for nomination or um, it's a ton of work um, the, uh, or at least, you know, in, in my case, Ava Marie, just it was a ton of time. Um, and so both you need someone who is kind and good, um, but also someone who's going to be able to give it that amount of time. Um, it's as those of you who've been nominators know, it is not a small job. Um, and it's important to sort of realize this isn't a matter of pulling a few things together and sending it off. Um, and again, I, I would, I would feel a lot, I felt a lot of anxiety about asking people to do that for me. Um, but I think it, it, it is important that when you are thinking about a nominator, that they are able to take on this fairly substantial task. So there's a question in the chat as well about, um, whether the nominator should be someone who was also a member of STLEG, and I've got uh, a number of answers saying, no, that's not necessary. Uh, so that's a good question. Other questions from the, uh, from the room, or I can ask the panelists to respond to anything that they wish or add anything they wish. I wanted to say that uh, a good nod in, in the context as we increasingly at UBC get more and more um, 3M National Teaching Fellows, and if you have one in your department, they might be a great nominator to approach, um, given that they've been through that. Um, uh, I mean, there's, al there's obviously other choices too, like Simon clearly had a, a good nominator in his mind, uh, but I think uh, seeking out help from an existing 3M NTF, I think is a good idea, even if they're not in your department, just to meet, meet with them and sit down and, and talk about what they did. Um, and, and who knows, maybe they will be willing to be a nominator for you, or at least help organize your package. I've got a different point to suggest um, the, that might be helpful is, is, I think it's hard to know what good, good looks like for this sort of document because it's an atypical document. Um, and so 
there's a temptation, I think, early on to say, hey, I wonder if I can read lots of other people's documents. And what I, what I did is, 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 is I, from memory, and again, it's going back over a number of years, is I delayed doing that initially because I think, you, from my point of view, you don't want to be overly influenced and think you're copying somebody else's document because it has to be yours. So I tried to do a draft based on the guidance of the, uh, of the, of the format. And it was frustrating because of all of the constraints and so on. And, and then, but I, I remember that um, um, I think it was probably after I'd been kind of turned down the first year, I, I contacted Peter. Uh, and Peter was kind enough to lend me or let me have sight of his document. He'd just won the previous year. Uh, uh, and uh, it was like a revelation. And I think if I'd seen that too soon, it wouldn't have been as helpful because it might have kind of narrowed me in. And, but, and the, one, the one big thing I took out of it, apart from just kind of reading it and seeing that it was so much clearer and more kind of compelling than, than what I had submitted, um, was that he'd done a little trick. He said you he talked about 51 pages and then going back to 50. But one of the things, and I double checked and triple checked with the kind of the criteria is, is if you use title pages between sections, which you can also put images on, they don't count in the page count, right? Um, and so uh, that was a critical kind of change to how I made mine more digestible and readable and gave some character to it. So it might sound like a small thing, but uh, that was, anyway, so Peter, five years later, thank you. I also took advantage of those uh, spacing pages. Uh, maybe I can flip my laptop around. Hold on a sec. So this is my cover page, which basically has a big drawing that I did. So I, I put all my art on these inter intermediate pages, but one could actually put anything there. Um, quotes from students. Uh, you could do a photo of you in your classroom. These are not things that actually count towards the page count, but they're actually spaces that can make your package more personal. So I think some things have changed and, and I don't remember if space, you know, spacing pages when I did it in 2012 was when I submitted it. Yeah. But and I think going back to something Paul said, I think that the instructions on the 3M website have become really quite prescriptive now. They're, they're quite guiding in, in what, you, you, um, what you should include. And so I think that aspect of personalizing it so it's not just formulaic really does come out um, going back to sort of getting advice from other people I, I i think it is essential almost essential that you do you do talk to one or two people who have won this just to understand what what they went through uh harry hubble was my guiding light and on the sort of side of things about not not being coy and not being shy i, I shared this in that analogy before I, I, some other people might not have heard it um, I, I'm, I'm not keen on sort of shouting out my, my, my strengths and I sort of, you know, I think as, as teachers generally we are givers rather than uh, people sort of seek, seeking out the limelight. And Harry gave me this analogy that he said, you know, so you're not good at, at playing, you know, shouting your own, uh, you know, tooting your own horn, you know, sort of playing your trumpet. So his analogy was get a trumpet, a metaphorical trumpet, go into a room, play it as loud as you can, but when you leave, don't think you're a trumpet player. So, you know, so within, within the confines of, of this exercise, you know, don't be shy of, of saying what you, what you have done, uh, but don't let it go to your head, basically. Okay, we're running a little low on time. There was a question in the chat about when do the criteria get published? Um, because right now it says that the STLHE and 3M have signed a new, uh, uh, agreement working on renewing the nomination process and deadline for 2021 um, as of I, I think last year at this time there were there was more information it, it might have been from previous years but uh, uh, someone replied in the chat that it's normally announced in May or June so it should be coming up soon are there any last questions or comments before we move to one more uh, aspect of the the session maybe maybe just one uh, comment for me so I uh, was nominated by my department head so not an STLHE member um, that came midsummer and it, it was more or less on me to put my other uh, he and uh, my Dean wrote a, a three and a half page letter uh, and the rest of it was was me who who uh, it was for me to seek out who would be submitting letters um, you know all those details so um, uh, it can be done, but it was a, a very busy summer. It, it occupied all my time right up to the day of the, the submission. So, um, so it doesn't have to be all 
led by a nominator. Uh, it can be the nominee doing a lot of that, that work as well. Great, thank you. So what next? Uh, as I've already mentioned, the provost office would need your dossier about a month in advance of the deadline, whenever that is announced to be. It's usually in September uh, to prepare the support letter. So Simon, would those go to you directly? Yeah, um, they normally go to me. And just a word on that. Uh, a month may seem like a long time to write a letter, um, but a few things. Um, faculty are like students sometimes, and they tend to hand, leave things to the last minute or hand things in a little bit late or even plead for an extension. Um, so it, it's a semi-flexible deadline. The, the other point is um, when crafting those letters, I, I need to spend quite a bit of time with the dossier. So advanced sight of an, a, a draft or a kind of 90% there, but I know I still need to make changes is helpful because it allows me to start organizing thoughts earlier. And the other reason why we asked for a month is that there have been years when we've had four or five nominations go in. And, um, you know, it, it takes time to do the work that you as applicants do justice. Uh, and so I need to uh, need to be able to prepare for that. That's great. Thank you. And from our end at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology, we can offer those who are looking to apply one on one consultations. We also have some sample dossiers from uh, many of the people who are on this call. Uh, and if those others have not shared their days with us and would be willing to do so, they could connect with Judy. Would you like to say anything about this, yes, Judy? So I have a few samples with me and I haven't asked point Tiffany yet, but uh, if you're willing to share, I'm happy to host them or um, I can direct people to, to you, to each of the, um, the, the fellows here. I'm happy to look at your, happy to look at your um, dossier and give you some preliminary um, thoughts. Um, is it compelling? Is there, is there a hook? So happy to work with you. Thank you. And that I think is it for our presentation.